alluded to this title, and has it been uh, available for two hours or more? It has. Amendment qualifies. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3200 offered by Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Add at the end of subtitle C of Title Seven of Division B the following. Without Section objection, 17. the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman from Connecticut is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we've heard from a lot of our providers and hospitals uh, back in our districts uh, about the two-tier medical system that often exists, uh, with Medicaid being a, an incredibly poor payer uh, for many uh, of our providers and hospitals. Um, this has a direct federal nexus because normally we're paying about 50 percent of Medicaid costs, uh, and under this bill we are going to be bearing an even greater responsibility for paying Medicaid claims uh, in addition to the new money put in the stimulus bill. There is in existing federal law a requirement that states uh, pay uh, rates sufficient enough to guarantee an adequate network uh, for those participating in Medicaid. Uh, unfortunately, the federal government really doesn't have the information necessary uh, to do an assessment of whether those networks are sufficient and whether uh, the states are paying enough to our providers and hospitals to get them to join uh, in. Uh, so this amendment is fairly simple. Uh, it well, would yield. We're prepared certainly. to accept the amendment on the minority and side. I, th I thank the ranking member and I'll yield back. <laughs> Any further discussion on this amendment? If not, uh, we'll proceed to the vote. All those in favor of the Murphy Amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendments agreed to. Who do we go to? Uh, Dr. Gingri, if he's here. Mr. Gingri. And then we were going to go to Dr. Burgess. And he's not here. Okay. Um, let's well, see who is here. Well, you're going to do your painting with this one, Paul. Uh, how about um, recognizing him? Mr. Barton, for what purpose do you seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk, uh, number. Uh, B E N E C H O I C E Ben Choice 001. It's a Barton Deal Premium Assistance Amendment. Read. Read it so we have the amendment. Let me inquire before uh, I recognize this amendment. It's been at the desk for several weeks. And is this to this title? It is to this title. Okay. Clerk uh, will read, report and read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3200 offered by Mr. Barton and Mr. Deal add at the end of Title 7 of Division B the following new subtitle. Subtitle 1, Beneficiary Choices Under Medicaid and S-CHIP. Section 1781. Easing Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. Mr. Barton, I uh, recognize you. Uh, thank you, and I want to also recognize Mr. Deal, who is the uh, co-author of this amendment. It's, uh, it's fairly straightforward. It would provide every low-income American the right to choose the health care coverage uh, that best fits their needs. Uh, it prevents the creation of a two-tier system. This would uh, uh, accomplish the goal of letting uh, people who are low income pick the care package that's best for them uh, because it would provide citizens who are on Medicaid or SCHIP the ability to choose the premium assistance program uh, to use the premium assistance uh, if they're working so that they could keep their employer sponsored insurance. Uh, if they don't have employer sponsored insurance they would get a voucher that they could then use to choose from a long list of high quality private health insurance programs uh, so that they could pick the plan that they want uh, that way. If we don't adopt this amendment, the underlying bill creates a two-tiered health care system that allows families making over $30,000 per year the ability to choose from potentially hundreds of different packages but would deny low-income families that same choice. I would be happy to yield to Mr. Deal for any comments that he wishes to make. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Obviously, as the uh, ranking member has explained, what this does is rather than falling under the provisions of the underlying bill that automatically enrolls a person or a family 
that is 133 percent of poverty and below, which would automatically enroll them in a Medicaid program. If they are employed and have a health care benefit through their employer, this would get, provide the option of a, uh, a sum of money that would allow them to pay their costs to participate in their employer-sponsored plan rather than be plan rather than being automatically enrolled in Medicaid as the underlying bill calls for. In other words, a family of, that earns $30,000 a year, family of four, would retain the right to choose what health care they would like to participate in. Democrat. If you're at 29000 plus of a family of four, you have no choice. You will be automatically enrolled under the underlying bill in a Medicaid program, even though you might prefer uh, to have some financial assistance that would help you stay in your employer offered plan. I would uh, urge the favorable consideration of this amendment. The gentleman yield to me, because I keep on getting uh, talking points on the wrong amendment. It's his, his time. Uh, it, 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 Mr. Barton, it's your time. This amendment, could you clarify exactly what this amendment would do? You want me to clarify? It, it simply creates the ability for people that are eligible for Medicaid and SCHIP. Uh, if they work, if they're working, they can, they'll get a, a premium. If they want to keep the health care they have where they work or take it, if they don't have it, they would get premium assistance from the government to participate in that plan. If they are not working or they don't have health care where they work, then they would get a premium assistance uh, voucher to, to, to choose the a number of plans in the marketplace that meet the Medicaid and SCHIP requirements, and then they would have the choice to choose which plan best fits their needs. So you would let them choose between their employer-sponsored health care or not participate in that and go on to Medicaid? Well, they, we, we'd give the, we would give the choice to the, to the beneficiary. Yes. They would not have to automatically go into some uh, public plan option. They would have the option of either getting premium assistance where they work if, if, if they had chosen not to participate in the plan where they work because they couldn't afford the uh, co-payment. They could, they could go into a plan in the private sector that was not at work and again they would get premium assistance for that or if they wanted to go into some public plan option that would be their choice. Now that's my understanding. I'm going to yield yes, Mr. Thank you, for, thank you for yielding. What it does is it requires states to offer this option, and it applies both to Medicaid and to SGIP. So take, for example, a child who may be in the SGIP program, but the parent has an employer-sponsored health insurance plan. This would allow uh, that parent to get the financial assistance to be able to pay the cost for keeping their child in their employer-sponsored plan rather than being shifted into SCHIP or for the individuals uh, who are Medicaid eligible having the same thing happen to them to be automatically enrolled. Uh, it simply requires the states to offer the premium assistance as an option. It does not require them to actually accept it one way or the other. Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Plum is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not questioning um, the intent of the authors of this amendment, but I'm concerned of the consequences because basically um, we have protections now under CHIP that ensure that children have adequate benefits and affordable cost sharing and that ensure that premium assistance does not increase federal costs. But uh, the way I understand this, that for the first time CHIP funds, and I use CHIP as an example, could be used to enroll children in private coverage that provides scaled back health coverage for children, charges deductibles and co-payments that low income families may have difficulty affording or cost more than it would cost to enroll the children directly in CHIP. Now, I understand that this is an option, uh, at least that's what uh, I know the authors are saying and I, and I take them at their word on that, but um, even though it's voluntary for parents, I think low income parents may have a lot of difficulty understanding all the differences between the benefits and the cost sharing requirements under the private coverage option and under the state CHIP program. So you could have significant numbers of low income children that could end up in health plans with fewer benefits and substantially higher cost sharing uh, charges and basically be significantly worse off than current law. I mean, I know how difficult it is 
myself just trying to sift through all these different things. And even though you're giving people the option, I think there can be a lot of confusion. And uh, I, I'm just very concerned. I, I think that, you know, we do have um, a premium assistance uh, options mm -hmm. under, the, under the CHIP program, but this would basically Thank change you. things so we wouldn't have these guaranteed protections. And that would be my concern, and that's why I think that uh, we should not uh, support the amendment. At least that's one of the reasons. Who's, is it Mr. our time or? Uh, no, it's Mr. Pallone's time. Okay. Would the gentleman yield? Yeah, I would yield, sure. Okay, first of all, we have a limitation that there's no additional out-of-pocket expense uh, to the federal government or the state government. So this doesn't cost more. Second, what we're doing is trying to empower people. We're trying to, we're trying to, as, as Chairman, as a ranking member uh, Deal said, the only shall in here is that the state shall give this as an option. But the option remains with, with the individual. The option is not with the not with the state. In other words, if an individual family can get better coverage for their children or themselves and they qualify for Medicaid and or S-CHIP, we're trying to empower low-income Americans. Now, I happen to think that low-income Americans are as smart as high-income Americans. The fact that they're low-income may be lack of education, it may be a physical handicap, it may just be bad luck, but that doesn't mean that they don't have the ability to differentiate what's best for themselves and their family. This is an optional thing. It doesn't cost more money. The only shall is that we say the states shall offer uh, the ability for people to choose. But uh, let, let me say, I don't understand what you're accomplishing. The concerns that I have, I don't think are adequately addressed by your response because I don't know, it's hard for me to assess looking at this language exactly how you know, some of these protections that you're suggesting would work. I know that the existing protections are strong, and I would be afraid that we would be losing them, and I don't really understand what we're accomplishing. The bill, uh, the, the S-CHIP bill that we adopted and signed into law this year does give states uh, the opportunity to provide premium assistance to CHIP eligible children whose families have access to employer-sponsored insurance. But the main thing is that the bill ensures protection that they continue to receive adequate benefits and have affordable cost sharing. I don't see how, I don't see what you're accomplishing with this, and I would be fearful that it might break down some of these protections without actually accomplishing anything. Uh, that's my concern, Mr. Chairman. I, I yield back. Mr. Chairman yields. I yield to uh, the gentleman from Texas. Mr. Sloan, let me uh, just ask you some questions and maybe we can get answers. Uh, this, I'm concerned about this because if we're concerned about the cost of Medicaid and S-CHIP under the bill as a whole, just allowing folks the option to take that amount of money and go under Medicaid or S-CHIP would still have the cost issue in there. And, but in our history, though, and you'll remember, uh, our committee created the uh, Medicare HMOs in the 90s that were supposed to be less than the average cost of Medicaid. And now we know that Medicare Advantage is 15 percent more than the average cost of Medicare. So that, that's my problem. I think the gentleman is correct. And remember, this program, you know, uh, we only passed this bill, uh, signed into law, what, six, not even six months ago. And, or, you know, I think that to make these changes now with all these concerns, it just doesn't make any sense, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Deals recognized. Um, I asked to strike the requisite number of words. Um, Mr. Chairman, let me clarify for my colleagues on the other side who don't understand the amendment. Uh, it's the difference between coverage and access. Ninety-six percent of all doctors accept private insurance. Less than half of the doctors in this country accept Medicaid. If a family is going to be automatically enrolled under your underlying bill in Medicaid with no choice, and have less than half of the doctors in the country willing to take them as patients versus giving them a subsidy so they can stay in their employer's Blue Cross plan, for example, and get 96 percent of the doctors in this country to treat them and their children, that's the difference. We've had great difficulty explaining to you all the difference between coverage and access. This is a bill, this is an underlying amendment that addresses that very clearly. Ms. Would the gentleman yield just briefly? Yes, certainly. I mean, I understand where you're coming, but 
we do have a premium assistance program that allows that to happen with the protections that I express. So, you know, why is it that you want to so quickly move away from that? I mean, it does exist now. We, you know, in the bill that we passed, there is the option. You're talking about you're talking about S chip, S -chip bill. S chip, yeah. Talk about Medicaid. Don't know that you've got one there. This applies to both S chip and Medicaid. If a family has a child enrolled in S chip and they like it. They are certainly free to do it. There's nothing that mandates in this amendment that they have to change. Uh, it's simply an option, and it's an option that relates to access to coverage, uh, access to uh, health care rather than just the broad issue of coverage. I would yield to the ranking member. Just want to point out this was part of our alternative package uh, to SCHIP two years ago. It's not a new idea. We're, we're simply we're, we're, we're taking the existing mandates either in current law or in the bill for coverage we're taking the existence the 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 existing states obligations we're taking the existing funding we're not changing any of that we're simply trying to empower low-income Americans who qualify for s chip for their children or Medicaid for themselves and give them the option if they want to enroll in a different plan than the state-sponsored Medicaid or S-CHIP plan, and that plan qualifies and doesn't cost them any more, the federal government and the state government more out of pocket. They can do that. That's all this does. Gentlemen, yield to me. It's Mr. D. I would yield. Now, as I understand your amendment, <clears throat> rather than allow a state to do what it can do now under Medicaid, which is this premium support idea, you would require a state to have a premium support option. And the, is that right? You would require a state? It would require them to offer it as an option. Okay. Now, could that mean that a child from a low income family could be talked into the idea of having their child go into a, what's called a um, health opportunity account where you have. Uh, you have to come up with the costs for your care, but then you get catastrophic coverage? Reclaiming my time. I don't believe that that is included within the underlying bill. Um, but the issue here is, yes, this amendment requires states to offer this as an option. Under the language that Mr. Pallone was referring to, the existing law, states are not required to offer an option. Uh, they can if they choose to, and I'm not aware that any maybe some, but not very many ha states have actually offered that. This would put this on the table as an option. But, it would, but the direct answer to the Chairman's question, we don't change the requirement that, it, that state plans or private plans meet certain minimum standards. So if that type of a plan met the standard, then the answer is yes. If it doesn't meet the standard, the answer is no. That's true, as long as the underlying bill language remains the same. Gentlemen, that's, yield that's to me. If the states have an option to provide this premium support for Medicaid children, why do you need now to tell the states they must do it? If the states haven't done it, it's because they don't think it's a good idea to uh, make uh, the option available for kids to be signed up in a plan that won't be as generous as uh, Medicaid. Well, because uh, the basic thing here of choice should rest not even at the state level, but the choice should rest at the parents' level, and that's, this is what this would require, a parent being given that choice as to what's best for them. Okay. And I would yield anyone else. Uh, your time has time? expired. And uh, to uh, take the last five minutes, I'll recognize myself. The, uh, the reason I oppose this amendment is that we allow states the choice to take the Medicaid children and to allow their, their parents to put them in a private insurance plan. That's now available for states. This would require them to do it. Well, why, why wouldn't they do it if they're allowed to do it? Well, I can see a number of reasons. We're empowering a lot of low-income people to be taken advantage of by salesmen who will say, don't stay with S-CHIP or Medicaid. Come to our private insurance plan it's going to be better. Well, then they sign up in a private insurance plan, and it's not better. We know what they get under Medicaid. 
We know what they're going to get under S-CHIP. It's guaranteed. But if they sign up in a private insurance plan, the out-of-pocket costs could be far greater. The, uh, the benefits may not be as generous. And then people are stuck. Now, we don't deprive the, the states under existing law to offer this, but I think that they don't want to offer it. And we, not, we should not require it. I'm always interested in the language that we empower people to make the decision, not the states. But we're talking about people who may not be as sophisticated. I know I'm, many of my friends are not sophisticated in trying to decide between insurance plans. But some of these people that are on Medicaid or SCHIP are particularly vulnerable. One option for insurance coverage would be to say, oh, you ought to sign up your children in a health opportunity account. That's, uh, that, that would be offered by the states immediately. And uh, this amendment would even prohibit a GAO evaluation of these accounts. Well, on a strongly bipartisan basis as part of the CHIP authorization law, Congress prohibited the Secretary from allowing any additional states from using health opportunity accounts. Now, why would they do that? Well, it, 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 the states could enroll Medicaid beneficiaries into high deductible health insurance plans. They could give the argument, you sign up your, your children in this health opportunity account, and they can, they can have catastrophic coverage, and then they can have some money to build up to pay for their primary care costs. But then if their primary costs are, exceed what's in their account, they may not be able to uh, uh, come up with the money to pay for uh, the children to get the basic services before there's any catastrophic trigger. So I, uh, I, I uh, don't think we're empowering people. I think we're in, in, uh, allowing Mr. Chairman, uh, the opportunity for, for uh, children and their families to be taken advantage of. And we have the state option. I wouldn't want a state requirement. Mr. Mr. Chairman, will you yield? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you yielding. I, and I know that you weren't uh, implying that the poor are intellectually unsophisticated and don't have the ability to uh, pick and, and choose a, a plan wisely. Uh, and I would say that uh, under the uh, precepts of H.R. Uh, 3200, uh, if, if this bill becomes law, uh, when you've got uh, all these uh, uh, comparative effectiveness of research councils, and indeed, if you if you have a, a public uh, plan that's uh, not only a competitor but also setting the rules and deciding uh, what the private plans, uh, what minimum standards they have to meet, uh, I think you just said that you were concerned that maybe these. Uh, uh, because of lack of sophistication, that, that the poor would pick a plan because some uh, sharp, shyster uh, salesperson would sell them a bill of goods and that they would get less than they would get under the current uh, Well, let Medicaid me reclaim plan. my time because I only have a, a less than a minute. I do believe that people can be misled in trying to choose between insurance options. And as a result, they could end up choosing an insurance option that we know will be a disadvantage to them. For example, these health opportunity accounts, they reduce the beneficiary access to needed care because low-income individuals and families would have to meet a high deductible before their services are covered because states are not required to contribute enough funds to the account to fully offset the high deductible. Many low-income beneficiaries are unlikely to be able to afford the remaining deductible. Well, that could actually increase federal Medicaid costs because even though they've always been touted as producing savings, they raise the cost by allowing individuals to keep any account funds after they are no longer eligible uh, and to use such funds to pay for higher provider rates than under Medicaid and to purchase non-medical services. So I, I just think that we're running too great a risk that people will end up in something that doesn't fit their needs and it could end up even increasing the Medicaid costs. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I would ask unanimous consent that you be granted 30 additional seconds, and I would ask you if you would yield to me. Uh, without objection, I'll be, uh, without objection, one additional minute. That's good. And I'd like to yield to the gentleman from Georgia. Thank you very much. And I'd like to ask counsel, counsel, under the underlying bill, 
when are Medicaid beneficiaries allowed to choose a plan under the exchange? I don't believe that they are. They never. For the current for the current population, there is a there is a very small group of new eligibles referred to colloquially as Miller eligibles are people who were previously in a plan who can continue to stay in the plan. But for those that will be enrolled in Medicaid under the existing underlying bill, they will never be eligible to choose a plan under the exchange that has been so highly touted in this bill. With the exception of that population, you're correct. Thank you. I, I would yield Well, back. I'll take my time back. Um, people in Medicaid will stay in Medicaid. Uh, at some future time, we may try to uh, allow them to go through the, um, uh, the choice through the exchange, uh, but at the present time, we want to make sure they have their health insurance, and Medicaid provides that, and uh, it's, in its fact, it turns out to be even less expensive than putting them into the exchange. Uh, all time has expired on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment will say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's have it. The Chairman, amendment's not agreed like to. Roll call vote. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Markey. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Ms. DeGette. Ms. DeGette, no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Joukowsky. Ms. Joukowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton votes no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns, Mr. Deal, Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield, Mr. Shimkus, Mr. Shattuck, Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer, Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich, Mr. Rodonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, aye. 
Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Miss, Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry, aye. Ms. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel votes no. Mr. Mar Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Ro uh, sorry, Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Hill. Sorry. Mr. Hill votes no. Mr. Space. How are you? Mr. Space, no. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield votes aye. All members respond to the call of the roll. Any member wish to change his or her vote? If not, the clerk will tally the vote and announce it when it's ready. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 21 ayes and 33 noes. 21 ayes, 33 noes. The amendment's not agreed to. Ms. Christensen, do you have an amendment you wish to offer at this time? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a, I'm offering an amendment that consists of two related amendments to the medical home uh, provision. You're combining it as one amendment. Yes. Clerk. Um, clerk will inform us whether this is to this title and has been available for two hours. It has, Mr. Chairman. It's okay. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mrs. Christensen of the Virgin Islands in subsection D4 of section 1866E of the Social Security Act as added Without by... Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. Mr. Chairman, may I have a big uh, inquiry? Uh, I don't know whether it's of council or parliamentary. Is it possible to know, are these two amendment, amendments substantially related or are they different enough that we ought to consider them individually? Um, it doesn't make any difference. If somebody offers an amendment, it could be they're both to the same section of the bill. They don't have to be anything more than that. Well, let me ask you this. To offer them as an on-block amendment, do you need to ask for unanimous consent to, to uh, combine them? No, because the amendments have been at the desk and we had a previous unanimous consent request. Or If not that, we've had an announcement that members may... It wasn't unanimous. We had an announcement that members may offer and combined amendments Combine amendments that had been in the desk into larger amendments. Parliamentary inquiry. Gentleman's state is inquiry. And this is a good example because in this particular in block, there's one of them that we're prepared to accept and one that we're not. What's the what's the requirement under the rule to ask for a division of the amendment? Is it up to the author or can any member ask for a division of the amendment? The chairman's. Um, Just I'm trying to get an answer uh, to give you a correct one. No, no. no what's you, you? Are you? You chair the? Yeah, it's it's a simple question to divide. Yeah, I mean, so, so someone can request an addition. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, Mr. Barton, I'd have to check in more detail with the parliamentarian, but Mr. Weiner, who has chaired the the uh, House floor uh, on many many occasions. Uh, has informed me that in his experience, whenever uh, a question is raised to divide 
an amendment and consider parts separately, that it would be a privileged motion. I would think that if you want to divide the question, if you ask unanimous consent, I, I don't know why anybody would object to it. Well, Mr. Chairman, with that, with, with that uh, parliamentary uh, explanation from the distinguished gentleman from New York, I would uh, ask unanimous consent to divide the amendment in, in, in pending uh, Mrs. Christensen into two amendments. Without objection, uh, that will be the order. And the chair wants to reserve uh, his comments as not a, an absolute commitment on the parliamentary procedure, because I would want to clear that with the parliamentarian. But by unanimous consent, we can certainly divide the question. And I would think it would be appropriate if members want to consider them separately. And then uh, for, uh, I would. Uh, what is the one you like? Uh, we will accept uh, the Christensen 001. Ms. Christensen, give us a sentence or two on that before we accept it. Sure. Uh, it, it just uh, inserts that the secretary shall, rather than may, seek to eliminate racial, ethnic, gender, and geographic health disparities through the use of medical homes. Uh, I can't see why anybody would object to that. Let's, let's uh, go to the vote on that uh, particular part of the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Gentlelady is now recognized for five minutes. Chairman, reserve a point of order. The gentleman reserves a po point of order uh, on her Second Amendment. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I can't understand why anyone would object. This is another very simple amendment. Uh, it was combined because they're both within the medical home provision. And it just uh, would say, it says that the secretary shall, among the pilot programs, select one that would go in a territory, not one in every territory, but at least one in a territory. The territories have very unique circumstances, high health care costs. They have high incidence of chronic disease and, com and, and complications from that chronic disease. And as American citizens who happen to live in offshore areas, uh, we feel that it is important for us to participate in this program, and it's, it would really be a big help to us in getting control over uh, problems such as diabetes. I believe Guam has one of the highest uh, incidence of diabetes in, the whole, in all of the United States and its territories. The Virgin Islands is pretty high as well. And we're faced with um, end-stage renal disease that we're finding difficulty accommodating um, space for. So I would hope that my colleagues would recognize the fact that we are a part of this country and would support this amendment that just says that among the pilot projects, we'd like to have one in one of the territories. Gentlelady, yield to me. Yes. Uh, as I understand it, the territories have never had any of these pilot projects in the past. And uh, we want to learn from these efforts. And I think that it's uh, only reasonable that we uh, make sure that the territories are not neglected in the awarding of these, um, of these efforts to um, eliminate uh, racial, ethnic, gender, and geographic health disparities. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a good proposal, and I certainly would join you in supporting it. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if I could just reclaim my time and the rest of the territories, because even though some are in the Pacific, some are in the Atlantic, some of the challenges we face are the same, so we could all learn from that one pilot program. Thank you. Mr. Barton? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise in respectful opposition. I'm obviously not opposed to a territory being chosen as a home of one of these pilot programs. But by the same token, I think whoever makes those decisions should be able to make them uh, uh, without being directed. Uh, what if the amendment was uh, uh, that, that it should be located in a state that begins with T, or in a state that was once a sovereign nation, or in a state, you know, in, in a state that has on its flag uh, a bear? I mean, you know, you could. There are all kinds of ways you can direct. Uh, I just think it should be an open process, and if, if it is the, um, you know, feeling of the, uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services or the Commissioner or whoever makes the decision, 
that, that a territory should be chosen as one of these medical pilot uh, projects, I'm all for that. I just don't want to direct that it has to be. So that's, that's why I respectfully oppose the Second Amendment. Any further debate? If not, uh, let's proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the Christensen, Christensen Amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. The amendment's agreed to. Now on the Republican side, uh, Mr. Gingrey, I think you had an amendment. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, yes. I'd like, I'd like to move to strike the last word. Um, General, General. I just, I'd just like to make an announcement from the, from the chairman. Without objection, advice. we'll recognize the general lady before we proceed any further, and probably have to go to the floor to vote. Soon. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Dingle has just asked me to remind the members uh, that that uh, this is the rule on the food food safety bill and that he'd like members, if they can, to uh, go down and vote on the rule, and then if they'd like to speak on the bill, to let him know. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This is a, a bill lady. that's come out of our committee uh, unanimously. If the gentlelady will yield. The gentleman for her Texas right. is recognized. The gentlelady. Would the you uh, yield Republicans. To I'd be happy to I would, yield. I would, I, let me couch this. The ranking Republican supports the rule. Because this this is a bill that was reported by our committee that we have worked in a bipartisan fashion. Thank but you. But we you will vote that. yes on the rule. At least I will. Okay. Mr. Gingrey, you have an amendment. Uh, the clerk will inform us whether it's an amendment that's been at the desk an appropriate amount of time and it's to this title. It has, Mr. Chairman, yes. As I understand it, uh, let, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Gingrey of Georgia. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. Recognize the gentleman from Georgia for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, this is a, a very straightforward amendment and a very important amendment. Uh, it would prevent the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare and Medicaid Services from using federally funded clinical comparative effectiveness research data to make coverage determinations for medical treatments, services, or items under Title uh, 18 on the basis of cost. Now, Mr. Chairman, we know that uh, in the pay-fors for this $1.5 trillion bill uh, that hundreds of billions of dollars have literally been taken uh, out of the Medicare system, uh, not the least of which, of course, is the amount of money that's uh, taken from Medicare Advantage, uh, a program that some 20 percent of our seniors choose uh, as uh, their uh, way of receiving health care under the Medicare program. Uh, and they make those decisions, of course, because uh, of the, the fact that, that many things are included that are not included under point of service. Uh, things like preventive care and emphasis on wellness. So uh, the concern uh, that, that I have is that when uh, crunch time occurs, and indeed it will, we heard uh, the CBO uh, last week talk about uh, the fact that this, uh, this bill uh, will not bend the growth curve and the cost of health care in the right direction. In fact, it will increase the cost, uh, that there, there will be rationing uh, and there will be d decisions based on the cost of, of a treatment, uh, a medication, uh, a, 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 uh, a, a, a particular surgery. Uh, and, and that's my big concern. And we have uh, examples, Mr. Chairman, of that already in Commonwealth Care in Massachusetts uh, and certainly in TenCare in Tennessee some 15 years ago is my uh, seat uh, mate, the gentlewoman from uh, Tennessee knows all too well. So this, this uh, uh, amendment uh, just very simply says that uh, the, comparative, the Center for Comparative Effectiveness of Research Data cannot be used by the Medicare Medicaid system uh, to deny a treatment uh, based on cost alone. Uh, if we look at, I want to have my, my colleague hold this chart up for me. I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, that this may be the, the uh, organizational chart 
of the House Democrats' health, pl health, uh, uh, health plan that uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi uh, said it, we were not permitted, no member was permitted to uh, use their franken privilege to send this to their constituents uh, to try to help them understand this very complex, difficult 1,100-page uh, bill. Uh, but in any regard, on this, uh, on this flow chart, or algorithm, I think you could call it, uh, there are a number of areas in which these decisions could be made to deny coverage based on cost alone. Right here is Comparative Effectiveness Research Commission. And of course, over here is a health care provider, your physician. And way over there on the other side, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, are the patients. This is, uh, I think, something that all of, uh, all of my colleagues, I hope, uh, would agree with. Uh, let's take an example of someone. Gentlemen, uh, yield to me. Uh, and, I, and I will yield. Does the chairman? Yes. Uh, yes, I'll be glad to yield to the chairman. I've looked over your amendment. I, uh, I, I, would, I will vote for the amendment and urge others to vote for it as well. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that very much, and, uh, I, but I, I will uh, I, I, want to, uh, I want to yield just a, 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 few, a few seconds to my colleague uh, from Michigan because I think it's important. The, the story that he has told before uh, needs to be heard again. Uh, and I'm going to yield just a few minutes, a uh, few seconds to my colleague from Michigan, Mr. Rogers. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think at this time, since they've agreed to accept the amendment, I, I best keep my mouth shut. Mr. Chairman, I would suggest that we take yes for an answer and go vote on the floor. Mr. Chairman, oh, yes. I agreed with a caveat that we don't have to see that chart anymore. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to accept yes for an answer, but I want to show one more chart, and that I've been I've been waiting for three weeks to bring this one up. <laughs> Democratic health care reform. You can have whatever you want as long as the boss approves. <laughs> boss Hogg. That's from, that's from uh, Hazard County, Georgia, uh, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman, time has expired. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the Gingry Amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment's agreed to. We'll now take another recess. We've got four votes on the House floor. Please return after the uh, last vote. Energy and Commerce Ranking Republican Joe Barton leaves the room, as do other members. They're called to the House floor. A number of votes dealing with uh, uh, various issues. They passed the defense spending bill for fiscal year 2010 earlier this afternoon. We'll have live coverage of their markup session once they gavel back in, live here on C-SPAN 3. In the meantime, we're going to take you to a news conference from just a short while ago. The Progress Pro Progressive Caucus, Progressive Democrats in the House, held a news conference on their view of the health care debate. It's about 25.